Okay, today uh, I will be covering the introduction, the principle of creation, the fall, eschatology and human history, the Messiah, his advent, and the purpose of his second coming, resurrection, predestinology, predestination, and, and Christology, Christological should be a Y. My apologies. Okay. Human being is struggling to attain lifelong happiness and overcome misfortune. From commonplace affairs of individuals to great events that shape the course of human history, each is at its root expression human aspiration for ever greater, ha ever greater happiness. Then how will that come about? Well, people feel joy when their desire is fulfilled. Oof, I don't know if I can do this mic thing. All right. So, if all the existing truths and philosophies out there were 100% true and accurate, would we not be living in a world of peace today? If the different religions out there had the absolute truth and put those into practice, then we wouldn't even need to be here in church today. We'd be out flying a kite or at the beach or doing something else, but that's not true. Why is that? Because there is an inherent contradiction within individuals that drives us in the direction of evil rather than the direction of good. The good news is we were born with an original mind that pulls us in the right direction. So if an individual has this contradiction within himself, then the family he creates will have this contradiction, then his community will have that contradiction, the nation that he lives in will embody that contradiction, the world he lives in will have that contradiction, and then history will actually be a history of contradiction. Is there anybody in this room who can argue that the world history is one of contradiction, pain and suffering? We all get it, right? Even the country that we're living here in Korea is divided north and south. Isn't that kind of strange? Was Korea always divided? No, it wasn't. Just like our mind and body. How then did this contradiction come about? Well, were we born with it or did we inherit it? Well, if God is good and created us, then we couldn't have been born with it. So somewhere along the lines, we inherited this contradiction. Where did you inherit your contradiction from? All right, so in Christianity, uh, we call this the fall. And so at one point, man was pure and fell into ignorance. All right. So once human beings left whatever position they were in and fell into ignorance, it's been a struggle for God from that moment to try to raise uh, his children to a point where they were not ignorant over the purpose of life and uh, what there is they're supposed to do, right? So there are two types of ignorance out there. All right, there's internal ignorance uh, and external ignorance. And so there are two bodies of knowledge, science and religion, to try to answer those kind of questions. So some are, what are some of the questions of, of internal ignorance? The biggest one, right? Does God exist? What is good? What is evil? What is my purpose? And what about for all you scientists out there? What are some of the scientific questions out there, right? We all have a physical body, right? So we all need food and shelter. Would you like to live in a nice apartment that has running water and electricity or in a cave? So obviously when we fell into external ignorance, we were living close to the level of animals and now we've progressed to the point where we actually have a nice, comfortable living environment. So the two bodies of knowledge that have sought to end ignorance are science and religion. All right. So religion seeks to answer these questions, and so does science. The problem is science and religion are seemingly at odds with each other, just like our mind and body are in contradiction with one another. What does the scientific viewpoint say about the creation of the universe? 
Anybody? Come on, young people. What is the, what is the predominant theory out there? The Big Bang, and then we evolved, right? What does the religious viewpoint, specifically the Judeo-Christian, talk about? Creation. Creation, right? In six days, you know, and then God said it was very good, day after day after day. That fundamental difference is uh, crazy, right? So you have these evolutionists versus religious people who are in contradiction all over the world trying to explain what it is we're supposed to be doing here. And it doesn't work. Look at history. So there's a need for a new truth. God knows we need a new truth. And so he presented a new truth for us. And this new truth needs to bring about unity of all the different philosophies, religions, and ideas that are out there and has to harmonize that um, with science. This new truth also has to bring us from our fallen state back to where we were originally intended to be. Make sense? All right, so obviously we know this new truth is the divine principle. And God chose one person, uh, the Reverend Sum Young Moon, to reveal this new truth. All right, is everyone on board with that? Did anyone not get that in the memo through your life of faith? Okay. So. Let's recap the important things to know about our introduction. We need science and religion for happiness, and we need an expression of new truth that will harmonize them. That's the key essence I'd like you to take away from this introduction. And there's a third thing. Who was the guy who revealed all this? Right there, on the wall, right? Make sense? All right, let's jump into the principles of creation. How am I doing for time? We'll see. All right. Before we begin this quest called life, we have to determine whether or not if God exists or if God does not exist. Someone who lives a life centered on God versus someone who lives a life without God will live two vastly different lifestyles. And then there's people in between that have some sort of vague concept of God and their lifestyle is accordingly. Does that make sense? Okay. Right here we are, the principles of creation. Okay, God is the causal reality of the universe. So then how can we come to know this causal reality? My good GOP student, when's the last time you saw God? I would imagine it's today, if you are aware. Did you see God today? You're not sure, are you? It's a good thing you're here. We're going to go into this. All right. OK. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. So by studying the resultant reality, we can come to understand about the nature of the cause. So today, while you're on the subway or wherever you go, you could be looking around and observing, and through observing the creation around you, you might be able to figure out something about the causal reality. I do it all the time. Trip out and watch God on my way to work. Trip out and watch God in my family. Trip out and watch God when I'm uh, hiking in the hills. Do you all do that? No? You're wondering where God is? 
Well, I would encourage you, as you go about your daily existence, to take a look around and see if you can see some of these common characteristics that I'm about to talk to you about. All right, all throughout the universe are common elements. What are the two most basic common elements? Well, according to the divine principle, they're dual characteristics of internal character and external form. There is also another set of dual characteristics of positive or negative, or yang or yin, masculine or feminine. And all of these dual characteristics are manifest in a variety of forms and variations throughout the universe. So every day you have the possibility of observing the creator. All right. Okay, so we say that God is the first cause. God is the original internal character and the original external form, the original masculinity and the original femininity. And he put a little bit of that in everything around the world, everything in the creation. You can break it down. Uh, how, many, uh, how many chemistry nerds I got in here? Oh, we got one, Dr. Richardson. All right, so we know there's positive and negative ions, positive valency, negative valency. You can build up from the smallest um, micro particles all the way up to humanity. All right, so we say God is the harmonious union of the original internal nature and the original external form. He's the harmonious union of masculinity and femininity and is the subject partner of internal nature and masculinity towards the universe. Okay, so then what is the relationship between God and the universe? This is where it starts getting complicated, right? God is the subject. First cause in relationship to the universe was the object result in creation. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. okay, so we can look up on this chart here. Uh, it kind of breaks it down. God is the origin, and he divides himself into a subject and object, and then through give and take action, that subject and object form a union. And um, this revolves, this, this model is not actually accurate. It's, it's not a plane. It's more of a spherical nature. So if those of you guys who study chemistry and atoms and molecules, you can see it's more of a spherical um, process. Okay, when each of the four then act as a subject partner and enters into give and take with the other three revolving around it, they fulfill the three object purpose. So in order for anything to be stable in the universe, there's need to be three supports. Does that make sense? All right, I hope so. Okay, this four position foundation will be manifest um, through this Bible quote, uh, Genesis 128. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God gave us a, a blueprint through this four position foundation and I don't have time to go into uh, the give and take action, universal prime force, and all the little microcosms because we have six more chapters to go through and I want to touch on the wave top. So I'm kind of blowing through it. But I believe most of you are familiar with the four position foundation and how action and energy is produced. Yeah? And if you don't, please hit me up afterwards and we can talk about it in detail. Okay. Why did God give us the three great blessings? What is our purpose? None other than to feel joy. This how God experienced joy, and it's how we experience joy. When we bring our mind and body into unity and harmony with our creator, we experience joy. And then we have give and take with someone else who has the same unity. We experience joy, and God experienced joy. 
This is our first blessing, individual perfection. All right? And our second blessing is when we perfect the family, husband and wife, centered on God, love each other, and then together as parents, they love their children. And then as a mature humanity, we take dominion over the earth. And uh, we can see that this is our blueprint. So is everyone clear that the three great blessings is the blueprint that God wanted to experience joy and happiness through and that we will experience joy and happiness through? All right, now does this happen automatically? It takes a time period. There's a process of growth. So I wasn't born like this. I didn't jump out of my, uh, my mother's womb like this. I actually spent some time growing. And everything uh, in the universe is created to go through a growing period of formation, growth, and completion. Okay, I wanna jump straight to the point. So all things of the creation follow the principle and have a certain autonomy in which they grow through their formation, growth, and completion. But human beings are different. We do follow the autonomy of the principle, but we also have a portion of responsibility in which to develop ourselves. And through this portion of responsibility, we leave the indirect dominion and actually mature where we can be in the indirect dom dominion and actually commune with God. Now, I would like to venture to say, how many people here in this room have actually gone through their growing period and are actually in the direct dominion of God where God is speaking to you and relating to you every minute of every day. Is there anybody here who's made it through to the direct dominion? Maybe you've had an experience where you were in the direct dominion for a short time, right? And therefore had this uh, kind of conversion experience. Okay. God created us to live on the earth and perfect and mature ourselves and take dominion over the creation and experience joy for a limited time on earth. And then God, once we left our physical bodies, we would live in the cosmos or in the spiritual world for eternity. So in theory, we would perfect our hearts. We would have an amazing time here on earth and we would be whole and perfect. And when we passed on, we would go into the spiritual world where we would continue this on for eternity, beyond time and space. All right, I don't know about you guys, but I like to go back in the 1700s and be part of the American Revolution. So in the spiritual world, I heard if your heart is perfected, you can actually move back and forth between time and space and go and check these things out. Wouldn't that be exciting? So I really want to take my portion of responsibility and grow and perfect myself while I'm on earth. My wife tells me that I'll probably be paralyzed when I go to the spiritual world because I haven't perfected myself. And if someone has not perfected themselves while they're on earth, when they leave and they go into the incorporeal world, they're kind of handicapped. So therefore, life on earth is very important. All right. Okay, that was the principles of creation in a drive-by, fly-by fashion, hitting the main wave points. All right, what key points should we take away? God's purpose for, for creating was joy. We bring joy to God through accomplishing the three great blessings, to be fruitful, to multiply, and have dominion. And we grow in the physical world and live in the eternal world forever. Are there any questions on the principle of creation? I know that was probably the fastest principle of creation lecture you ever heard. <coughs> yes, yeah, some of you guys, I, I, I get it. All right. We'll go on to the next chapter. Chapter two, the human fall.
life, which inclines them to reject evil and pursue goodness. Yet even without our being aware of it, we are driven by evil forces to abandon the goodness which our original mind desires and to perform evil deeds which in our innermost heart we do not want to do. As long as these evil forces assail us, the sinful history of humanity will continue unabated. In Christianity, the master of these evil forces is known as? I can't hear you, is known as? What are some other terms for it? The devil made me do it, right? All right. We have been utterly unable to liquidate the forces of Satan because we have not understood Satan's identity or how he came to exist. So if you have a disease and you don't know how you got the disease and you don't know how the disease manifests, how can you get rid of it? So this is one of the key points of the divine principle and why Reverend Moon is so incredible. He was able to actually figure out what was the cause of the human fall and educate us about it so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Now, this chapter in itself deserves about 24 hours and a lifelong of study. So I'm going to try to go and hit the wave tops in it, okay? All right. The root of sin. What is this root of sin? I had a uh, discussion uh, with many people uh, in my life of faith about this. So, what's your favorite fruit? You don't have a favorite fruit? Come on, I find that hard to believe. What is your favorite fruit? Avocado. All right, wow. That's unique. Be jonesing for some avocados. All right. So in the story of uh, Adam and Eve, we have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We have a uh, serpent. Uh, we have a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the traditional story is uh, because Eve didn't listen to um, God that she ate, to take a, took a bite out of the apple. Right? And as a result of eating this fruit, somehow we deviated from our original purpose. Once again, I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite fruit? Apple? OK. I want to ask uh, someone up here. Have you, uh, where, do you, where do you get your, where do you buy your fruit? Market. Market? Okay. Have you ever seen any fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for sale in the market where you go shopping? No. Uh, no. That's strange. Well, it was there when Adam and Eve were around, so why aren't they selling it now? And if it's not here anymore, then why are people acting evil? Because this is the fruit that caused us to deviate. You guys like going out into nature? One time I took my son out rock climbing, and he was climbing up these rocks and everything, and he's usually a very careful climber. He was up about mm, 10 meters, and suddenly he just dropped. <laughs> when he climbed up the rock, on the next ledge he was going up to was a snake staring him right in the face. And Matt just said, I'm out. <laughs> Came straight down. So sometimes in nature, especially in California, um, there are a lot of snakes out there. In fact, I've had to catch several rattlesnakes. Um, I even got bit by a few snakes. All right, so in the Garden of Eden, there was a snake. Every snake that I've uh, encountered never spoke a word to me. I even tried talking to them. Hey, man, can you move along? I got to get through here. So my point is, driving this home, that this story can be interpreted literally or symbolically. And so according to Reverend Moon, this is a symbolic story. And if we can understand the symbolism of this story, then we can understand what the root of sin is. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. 
All right, so we take a look at the Bible as our reference source. And I want to read this. And, the, and out of the ground the Lord made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I'm just going to jump to the conclusions. The tree of life is a symbol for perfected Adam. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a symbol for perfected Eve. Then what is the fruit? What symbolizes the fruit? And then what symbolizes, what, what is this talking snake? Anyone know? All right, so let's study our Bibles a little bit more. We can glean something here. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So we got this snake talking to Eve saying, hey, this fruit's good. Go ahead, have a bite. It's delicious. In fact, when you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened. In Peter, we find another verse, verse very curious. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of the nether gloom to be kept until the judgment. And the angels that did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, have been kept by him in eternal chains, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise acted immorally and indulged in unnatural lust serve as an example. So in Jude 6, 7, we understand that they acted immorally and indulged in unnatural lust. So once Adam and Eve ate of this fruit, they realized their eyes were both opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So making a in the divine principle, it goes into detail about the identity of this talking snake. But I'm just going to jump the gun here and explain that this serpent was a symbol for the archangel Lucifer. All right, so the root of sin in the first human ancestors came about through a sexual relationship between that archangel Lucifer and Eve, and then Eve seducing Adam. And therefore, instead of being under God's lineage, if we had followed the three great blessings and we had followed the commandment to do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we would be in God's lineage. There would be no religion. There would be no church. We would have just populated the earth and enjoyed an amazing environment living together with our brothers and sisters and families. However, Adam and Eve deviated. As a result, we've come under the dominion of Satan and are connected to his lineage. And therefore, we need to be restored and brought back. But then how will God do this? How will God bring us back? Okay, so here are the key points I want you to take away by this flyby divine principle part one. The original sin was the misuse and corruption of love. Because of the fall, we could not fulfill the three great blessings. Because of the fall, we inherit Satan's fallen nature and the fallen lineage, and God's heart was broken. Now, I don't want to ask such a personal question to you. Have you ever had your heart broken? But I'll just tell you, I've had my heart broken, and then after I got over my heart being broken, I decided to stand up and take some action, that I'm not going to be a victim. And I'm sure God, in the same way, when he saw his children stolen away by the Archangel Lucifer, then started developing a plan on how he was going to restore his children back to his bosom. And that's the next chapter we're going to talk about. Eschatology and human history. I've never really liked that word eschatology because I have no idea what it means and I have no idea how to put it in a sentence in normal conversation in day-to-day -day life. Have you ever gone up to your comrades or your friends or your office workers and said, hey, what's the eschatology of today going to be? It's a big college word. So when we're confronted with big college words, what do we do? We go to Google. And according to Google, there's a number of references there. It, it's, uh, eschatology means 
the study of history, especially the events towards the end of the world. So we're going to take a look at the uh, history or the end of the world. In Christianity, this is referred to as the last days. So the meaning of the last days. Uh, what is the meaning of the last days? How do we know if we're in the last days? Because every generation of Christians, uh, going back a thousand years, thought that their time was the last days. Do you believe that you're living in the last days? Hmm. We're going to take a little look into this. All right. In the last days, what God will do is send the Messiah to the present era and eradicate hell on earth. So this intersection between Satan's culture and God's culture is when the Messiah comes. And the Messiah brings a new truth and through the people receiving this new truth begin to eradicate Satan's culture and way of life and begin to establish God's dominion over the earth. God's sovereignty. Okay. When I was in my born-again Christian phase, I was really excited about the earth being destroyed and blown up with fire. And I, and I knew, because I knew Jesus, that he was going to come get me. And all those people who didn't believe in Jesus, oh well. <laughs> but would a parent do that? Could you do that to one of your children? Maybe you're um, a parent out here in the audience and you have some kids and maybe one of your children really is totally into divine principle and others are not so much. Would you just write that child off and say, oh, I got some good kids and the other kids. Could you even forget about your children? No, so God's the same way. What is this judgment of fire? all about that uh, we hear so much about, you know. You ever see those TV shows, uh, preppers who are preparing for the last day? You know, they build bunkers and uh, store up food for the, the end times. All right, so let's take a look at the Bible again. Signs of the last days, fire judgment. It says the heavens will be kindled and the tongue is a fire. So when we look through the Bible, and I don't have time to go into every single Bible verse here, but once again, we find some symbolism in the Bible. Just as the uh, serpent was not a talking snake, this literal interpretation, according to Reverend Moon, is not the correct interpretation of the Bible. Okay, so what I'd like to say is that the fire that's going to come is the judgment of the word. The tongue is like a fire. And if you can accept, based off that one Bible verse, that when the new truth comes in the last days, it's not going to be calamity and bombs and nuclear war, but a new truth that will bring judgment to men's actions and women's actions, um, that's what I'm suggesting. So in the last days and all throughout history, God has been relating to people based on their spiritual level, level um, and the degree and scope in which they could understand truth. Basically, based off the spiritual development of man, God would reveal truth along the way. It's very parallel, uh, and I'll just make an analogy here. When you have a baby, right, you don't feed the baby what? Mac and cheese. You feed the baby milk and then applesauce and then finally the baby's teeth developed and he can take solid food. It's the same way with fallen people. So when we fell into a state of ignorance, do you think if the divine principle was revealed at that time, anyone could even understand it? Probably people didn't even read, right? So based on the degree and scope of someone's spirit, God reveals different truths to help raise us up out of ignorance. So in the last days, um, oh, my apologies. 
All right, so spirit and truth are unique, eternal, and unchanging. However, the degree and scope of their teaching and the means of their expression will vary from one age to another as they restore humankind from a state of utter ignorance. Okay, so this new truth has that purpose. This divine principle has now been revealed to us at this time in history. So therefore, we can kind of synopsize that we are living in the last days. And once again, to understand our attitude and the new truth in the last days, you really need to take some time out and study the divine principle. I did not do this chapter justice, and I'm not sure how uh, in this time period I could. All right, so the key points. In the last days will be the end of Satan's control and establishment of God's dominion. It will not be a fiery apocalypse, but judgment by the word of truth. And God reveals his truth according to the age and culture. Can everyone take those key points with them? I see someone taking notes there, so you're going to have a good little synopsis of the divine principle. All right, here we go. Chapter 4, the Messiah. So we talked about this Messiah, right? This Messiah comes to reveal a new truth. The word Messiah in Hebrew means the anointed one, signifying a king. The chosen people of Israel believed in the word of God as revealed through the prophets, which promised that God would send them a king and a savior. Such was their messianic expectation. God sent this Messiah in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. The Messiah comes to fulfill the purpose of God's work of salvation. So because Adam and Eve and their descendants fell into ignorance, God had to send a Messiah to raise them back up and bring them back to their purpose of creation. All right. Jesus was sent to the Jewish people who had been raised up for 2,000 years. And there were many prophecies surrounding his birth. I don't have time to go into all the little details, but I'm sure you're all familiar with the Christian background surrounding Jesus. We know that Jesus was here uh, for 33 years on earth and gathered his disciples, and then he was miserably crucified. And today, many Christians believe that by believing in the cross of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, that they can fulfill the purpose of their creation. But if we go back to the principle of creation and we look at the three great blessings, we find a contradiction. I once brought my father to a divine principle lecture and I showed him the principles of creation. And then we started talking about uh, Jesus. He goes, well, if your divine principle is so true, then what happened to Jesus? So just by seeing the three great blessings, he was able to deduce that there was a difference between Christianity and what we were saying. All right, so Jesus came as the Messiah in order to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. All right, then there is, some, there is a limitation of salvation through the cross, right? If Christianity and the Messiah, Jesus, had come 2,000 years ago and they had brought the absolute truth needed to reestablish the purpose of creation and to fulfill the three great blessings, would we be even here having this discussion? No, we wouldn't. All right, so has any believer uh, in Christ become one with God and been able to fulfill the purpose of creation? No, they haven't. When Christian families have children, are their children born without sin or do they need redemption through the cross? They need the cross, right? Why is that? Because in Christianity, the sin is passed down from generation to generation. All right. So even though Jesus died on the cross and made great sacrifices, the will of God to establish the three great blessings wasn't fulfilled. 
And therefore, God needed to send another Messiah. So then, what do we gain through the cross? Does that just mean that Jesus' sacrifice is null and void? No? Okay. Jesus bore the brunt of Satan's attack through his body on the cross. However, he was not able to establish the physical salvation which the three great blessings would have given us. Yeah, I'll just read it straight. Jesus laid the basis for spiritual salvation by securing the victorious foundation for his resurrection through the redemption by his blood on the cross. To complete the work of spiritual and physical salvation, Jesus must come again on earth. Jesus' death on the cross. I'm going to look at some Bible verses here. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Okay, so these are the words of Jesus' disciples. If his death on the cross was supposed to be, then why would his disciples be lamenting his death on the cross? If Death, if Jesus' death on the cross was going to solve everything, and now we're back to square one, wouldn't they be happy? Like, yeah, Jesus did it. He died on the cross, and now we're free. But they were not happy. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Judging from the viewpoint of God's providence, God called the chosen people of Israel and prepared them to receive the Messiah. All right, let's take a look at the words and deeds of Jesus. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. Matthew 23, 37. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So we know due to the ignorance and disbelief of the Jewish people, Jesus had to go the way of the cross. And God had to rework his plan to send another Messiah, his second coming. Why did that happen? Why did the Jewish people not accept Jesus? For 2,000 years, God raised up the Israelites, took them out of Egypt, and gave them the land of Canaan to receive the Messiah. What was the linchpin that prevented Jesus from being accepted and placed as the new king of Israel? I'm going to go into it very briefly. So there were many prophecies about an Elijah who was to come before uh, Jesus, before the Messiah. And uh, all the Jewish elders and priests and rabbis were waiting for this Elijah to appear. Behold, I will send you Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The Jews of Jesus' day were waiting for Elijah because God had promised them through the prophet Malachi that Elijah would return before the advent of the Messiah. So this was like a key indicator. Once Elijah shows up, that means the Messiah is going to come. So all the Jewish people were looking for this guy, Elijah. So his disciples came to him and asked about uh, John the Baptist. And he told them, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Elijah does come, and he is to restore all things. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was this Elijah. Yeah. 
And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you the Elijah? He said, I am not. So John the Baptist did not understand who he was in relationship to Jesus. And as a result, because John the Baptist was a very well-known and re renowned and revered uh, Jew at the time, he was not able to testify to Jesus. And therefore, the Jewish people crucified Christ. I know that's a flyby, drive-by explanation of it. Very brief. All right. So let's go over the key points. God's kingdom, not the cross, was Jesus' original mission. Through the cross, we do receive spiritual salvation. John the Baptist's failure was the main reason Jesus had to go the way of the cross. Now, what's very interesting to me, and many of my uh, moksanims in the past told me that I am in the position of John the Baptist for my heavenly tribal messiahship, that each one of you in this room are in the position of John the Baptist. So if you study this part of the divine principle, you won't make the same mistake that John the Baptist did. Does anyone remember what John the Baptist did? Instead of taking care of Jesus, what did he do? He went his way, right? And his way was to go around and judge people for doing bad things. Instead of attending Jesus, and instead of taking care of Jesus, he went around and started judging everyone else who wasn't living a good life. Does it sound familiar? Do we know brothers and sisters who spend their time running around judging other people for their not so good lifestyle? What happened to John the Baptist? They got his head, his head was chopped off, right? And he did not fulfill the mission. And then Jesus had to go the way of the cross. It's tragic, right? So I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't spend your time fighting and judging other people. Spend your time attending true parents and the Messiah. Throw that plug in there for world peace and unification. All right. Yeah, get some. Resurrection. What does resurrection mean? Yes, excellent. To come back to life. Very good. If we are to believe literally in the prophecies of scripture, we should expect that when Jesus comes again, the saints will come back to life in the flesh their bodies buried in the earth and completely decomposed will be reconstituted to their original state. On the one hand, the prophecies are the word of God, and as people of faith, we must accept them. On the other hand, given the modern state of our knowledge, they do not make rational sense. This brings great confusion to the Christian faith. Therefore, it is important that we elucidate the true meaning of resurrection. Okay, so you get the trophy award. Resurrection, to come back to life, all right? How does someone come back to life? If you're dead, how do you come back to life? All right. When we study divine principle, we realize that the death they're talking about is symbolic in nature. The death means the death caused by the fall. So when Adam and Eve fell, they became spiritually dead, spiritually ignorant. So to restore, to resurrect, means to restore or resurrect one's spirit. Okay, so the death caused by the fall, regardless of the human fall, God created the human 
physical self to grow old and return to dust. Only the spirit self enters the spirit world and lives there eternally. All right, so we have the, um, the death caused by, by the fall. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. So when God gave the commandment to Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, did they physically die? They did not, correct? They were still alive. So what they're talking about is a spiritual death. All right. So coming back to life, Resurrection may be defined as the process of being restored from the death caused by the fall to life, from Satan's dominion to God's direct dominion through the providence of restoration. Now, uh, Eric Young Nam is going to be talking to us in part two about this incredible process of restoration. Um, but for purposes here for resurrection, we're just going to be talking about being restored from Satan's sovereignty back into God's sovereignty from cutting out Satan's lineage and accepting God's lineage. All right, key points. God designed us to live briefly on earth and eternally in the spiritual world. Resurrection means to move from spiritual death to spiritual life. Resurrection means to move from Satan's dominion to God's dominion. There is so much more about resurrection in the divine principle. So I'm hoping that this will cause more curiosity from you other than just saying, oh, I'm going to come to church and endure this. What I'm hoping is to dangle a little worm in front of your, your eyes and get you to look a little bit more deeply into the divine principle and figure out how then does that happen? If coming from spiritual death under Satan's dominion means coming back into God's grace, how would one do that? How will you do that? How will we do that as a society? All right. There is another concept within Christianity uh, called predestination. What do you think? It's caused a lot of confusion throughout history, so I want to address it here very briefly. Theological controversy over predestination has caused great confusion in the religious lives of many people. Let us begin by examining the source of this controversy. In the Bible, we find many passages which are often interpreted to mean that everything in an individual's life, prosperity and decline, happiness and misery, salvation and damnation, as well as the rise and fall of nations, comes to pass exactly as predestined by God. In Romans 8.30, those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. We find some other verses there that say, I have shown mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not upon man's will or exertion, but upon God's mercy. So we're going to do a little uh, exploration of the Bible here to address this. All right. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. So did God predestine Adam and Eve to fall? Or did God have something else in mind? Did God predestine Jesus to go to the cross? Or did he have something else in mind? Therefore, this predestination is actually a very important topic. I'm not sure if I can do it justice here. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So after Adam and Eve had fallen, God was sad. If God had predestined Adam and Eve to fall, 
and that was his will, when Adam and Eve had done it, wouldn't he be happy? I know when my kids, when I set them up to do something and they accomplish it, it makes me happy. It's amazing. When you come home and the dishes are done without having to ask anything, wow. But that's not the case in this, in this, in this verse. Also in the Bible, we find ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. So in this Bible verse, it says we have to actively pursue our life of faith. If your life of faith was predestined, then you really wouldn't have to do anything, right? You would just be perfect like that because God has predestined you to be perfect. So I'm trying to point out the contradictions here in some of these Bible verses. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So we can see that there's two different ideas here in the Bible. One, and a whole religious group has based their theology on this predestination concept, and others believe that we actually have some level of responsibility. All right, and we can see on either side, those biblical verses that uh, refute predestination and those that affirm predestination. All right. So God's will is absolute, unique, eternal, and unchanging. And uh, I'm sorry, God is absolute, unique, ah, uh, you go. Absolute, unique, eternal, and changing. And therefore, God's will is absolute. It follows the same pattern. Okay. So we're going to take a look at this. All right, so we have the fulfillment of God's will, and we have human responsibility. And I'm just going to break it down into a nutshell. So the fulfillment of God's will is absolute. It's 100%. God's portion of responsibility is 95%. And human responsibility is 5%. So the predestination of the fulfillment of God's will is conditional. And the predestination of human beings is conditional. History would have been very different if Adam and Eve had not eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. History would have been very different uh, had Jesus not gone to the cross. History would have been very different at the Yankee Stadium rally, if the brothers and sisters who were there did not start singing out of absolute faith, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, and was able to make that event a success. History, your history, your life will be very different if you put your responsibility and accomplish it in connection with the providence. And right now, we have this condition that we're doing, right? For 40 days to inherit the holy wine, uh, holy candle, holy salt, and holy earth. We have a responsibility over these next four years to make that successful. It's not predestined. Does that make sense? All right. Um, okay. Let's go into this. Key points to take away from predestination. God's will is absolutely predestined, but the fulfillment of God's will is conditional based on the fulfillment of human portion of responsibility. So we got to make it happen. Do you think the kingdom of heaven is going to automatically appear? No, we are, we are the ones that have to create it and build it. All right, I have three minutes to finish my last chapter, I want to stay on track. I was given one hour to go through these, and here we go. Three minutes. Christology. What is Christology? For fallen people who seek salvation, Perhaps the most important questions among the many they must resolve con concern Christology. 
Issues which fall within the scope include the Trinity, which deals with the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as well as the rebirth and the relationship between Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and fallen people. So we always go back to the principles of creation and the four position foundation. All right. And in Christianity, they have the doctrine of the, uh, the Trinity. So you have God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and through this, you're born again. So as a Christian, if you accept Jesus and the Holy Spirit into your life, you can be born again. All right. The value of a person who has realized the purpose of creation is vastly different from this. Someone who lives together with God, with their mind and body united, becomes a perfected person who has divine value, unique existence, and is the same value of the cosmos. All right, this is the value of Jesus. Jesus came and perfected himself. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Come on. All right. So God has a relationship with Jesus. But is Jesus God? Jesus is not God. And so in many uh, Christian circles, they believe that Jesus is actually God. God incarnate, God on earth. So, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and their mission is to give rebirth to uh, their followers. Uh, let's do this. Okay, does everyone understand that concept? So this is where Nicodemus said, you must be born anew. All right, so... I'm just going to cruise through these. All right. All right. I will have to study this more. And uh, maybe you can invite me back to give a lecture on this part of the principle. I've reached my max effective range. But I will, in my attempt to offer this to you, give you some key points to consider. The Messiah is a perfected individual who is one with God. The Messiah is not God. We need to be reborn due to the fall and our fallen lineage. The original Trinity should have been God, Adam, and Eve. This concludes part one of the divine principle. I am one minute and 21 seconds over. I want to thank you for being such a gracious audience and listening. That was uh, part one in one hour.